Welcome to the Big Picture Film Club. Today, I'm joined by writer, director, Miss Anne Harriman, whose film, The After, is now screening on Netflix. And so we're going to chat about the film, his background in photography, which I'm very keen to know about, um, and everything about the film, how it came about, how it got on Netflix. Uh, so let's jump into it. Uh, Miss Anne, how are you doing? I'm good, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I just I was very keen to know how how did the film The After come about? And I, I think if I'm not mistaken, is this your directorial debut? And it so is, yeah. Yeah, and so that's it's a it's very it's a very bold choice. And in terms of your first film, like why why does this film um why is this film the film for you? And what, why was this the first choice? Well, I think, you know, when I was discussing with Nikki, the extraordinary producer of this film, um, about what stories are in my head, I, there are probably a hundred, maybe 500, maybe a thousand stories, that, <laughs> you know, in my head that are pretty much fully formed. This one uh, made sense. She thought, um, you know, and I agreed that, you know, a short is uh, the best direction to, to really go. Um, as a first time filmmaker and um, Netflix agreed, but I wanted it to be me. And when it's me, it has to have a level of intentionality and emotional honesty that I believe that my pictures have shown the world. Hmm. And so this, this story um, really is a, ta a tapestry of some personal experiences and just things that, that I've read and seen on social media and the news and all, obviously our, collect our collective experience during George Floyd and lockdown. So I think all of that is part of the ingredients that made the story. And then I linked up with a, a young writer called JJ, who had this amazing you know, elasticity of thought to put a lot of the feelings um, that I was trying to find onto the page. And uh, sort of in the film, not to give too much away, I, I think I can give away this bit, but, um, you know, there's a uh, day. This one I know, you're definitely not, you're definitely not Nigerian, because if you're Nigerian, you're like, everybody dies, yes, yes, he's a ghost, he's a ghost. Uh, when, when the uh, sort of tragedy happens to um, Deo's um at the beginning and you know what happens to his family i suppose the focus uh, isn't so much on the actual event it's very mm -hmm. much on this um how he I, I wouldn't even say recovers necessarily but how he deals with it how he mm -hmm. internalizes mm -hmm. it how he reflects on what's happening and was there like a conscious decision on all right, there's this traumatic event happening, but actually, you know, the the technical aspect of the, the specifics of that event are not the focus. No. And they don't need to be explored because everything is really, like, it, the heart of it is really in this process afterwards. Was that like yes. a conscious... Yeah, and yeah, the, the after, how do you function within yourself and in society when all has seemingly been taken from you. How? And that feeling, I know, you know, chronic depression, suicide is, is as highest rate has been for years. And there are many people in the world that feel that they don't quite know how they can find light within themselves in this very complicated world. So I wanted it to be clear on <clears throat> the character's loss, but then to focus on how one can build oneself back up brick by brick. And how did uh... and also there's a there's an East egg there, you know, and I, I you know I'll give I'll give you a pass because you're Ugandan, but you said Deo. <laughs> now the yeah. East egg is if you listen to the scene where there's a voicemail, he gets two two voicemails. One is from a man's voice, and the Easter egg is that's actually me. Um, and that man is is his mate and he calls the character by how his name should be said because it's a nigerian name so he yeah, calls yeah, yeah. him that dio uh, ah, okay yeah 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 and, and then <laughs> and then the what's interesting and i love this because a lot of people that understand you know nigerian um culture will be like ah interesting 
But then when the English lady calls him, she calls him Deo. And it's a yeah. small little thing I've thrown in there yeah, yeah, for those yeah. who will be like, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that out there. I haven't said that before. So there you go. You got you got an Easter egg. I, I got a scoop there. I got a scoop. I'm happy. <laughs> um, how did uh, David uh, Oyelowo actually get involved in the project? I DM'd him. I slid in, man. Slid in. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I slid into his Instagram and I, you know, I've, I've idolized him for most of my life and I know I'm not alone. And um, I just said, look, I'm thinking of getting into film. And uh, he replied saying that he was already a fan of my photography, which floored me. And that, you know, and, and as they say, the rest is history. It was just that easy. DMs, straight up, no agents, <laughs> Okay, fair enough. And in terms of your background in photography, mm. like how did that, start and how has that evolved over the years well I, I you know i don't know how much you, you know of what happened to me in the summer of 2020 but obviously um when george floyd was killed i documented the protests in london they have become some of the most shared civil rights images of of this this era and off the back of the visibility of those images i was commissioned by british vogue to shoot the september issue which is obviously you know in fashion at least is a not a small deal. And I shot Very Marcus big. Rashford and, and, and Adwerb uh, um, in, in, for the September issue of 2020. That's how the world really discovered my lens. I'd only been shooting for a short period of time. This all happened very fast. And since then, I've been trying to move with a sense of intentionality and purpose with the images that I take and the issues that I fight to be seen through my lens. Um, and so I imagine moving forward, you you would still kind of do that and the films sort of hand in hand like whatever whatever the creativity yeah. yeah yeah it's i'm a storyteller whether that lives in in my capacity as you know chair of one of the largest cultural institutions in europe or my photography or the work i do with the charities that i work with save the children and choose love or filmmaking it's 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 to use art and culture to bring attention to issues that I care about or to exercise demons that are still climbing out of me. Usually a mixture of both. <laughs> and um, one thing that was really, like, piqued my interest um, about the release is that it's on Netflix, available now, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but Netflix are not necessarily known for short films. And I think, no. you know, short films, uh, you know, don't always have the best avenues for distribution. Yeah, um, yeah. They don't often get, I think, the sort of broader recognition that they deserve as great pieces of art in of themselves. And so how did that Netflix link up happen? Well, you know, I think um, that we, you know, people heard that I wanted to get into film and because of um, I would say my visibility as a photographer, um, conversations were had with numerous companies like Netflix, but I was really impressed with the people I met at Netflix, uh, Lisa Nishimura, Tendo, and then my executive for this film, who really commissioned the film was Fiona Lamti, and, and of course, Anne Mensa. And, um, you know, they allowed me to do something, you know, I mean, you've seen this, this is not, not many platforms put what I've put on screen in terms of where yeah. where it goes, right? Um, and I've got to applaud Netflix for allowing this to be unapologetically uh, the vision of what I wanted for my first film. Now, I believe it's Netflix's first UK original short. Um, oh, wow. they've also Congratulations. Got, they've got, yes, and, and this season they also have the wonderful Henry, Henry Sugar film with Wes Anderson, which is also a short. So I think, as you said, I completely agree, shorts as a standalone medium are... Um, as important as powerful as, as as anything in the moving image. So hopefully, I won't be you know the the last to do this with a platform that has such a reach. I mean, today it's dropping to circa two hundred and thirty million people will have access to a short film. There is no universe uh, in a regular film industry that a short film you know you do a, you do some festivals and you know it's almost impossible to get into a cinema. So it kind of ends up on a Vimeo page, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is I'm very thankful and I hope this helps the industry invest and celebrate the short form, live action and animated um, side of things uh, even more. Um, 
And uh, if I'm correct, you're also the chair of the South Bank Center. Yes, Is sir. Oh, and so in terms of like in terms of your, I guess, ability from a wider perspective to help steer arts and culture in a particular way mm -hmm. or, or help, uh, you know, drive the vision of the South Bank Center. What does that mm. involve for you and what are you hoping for the South Bank Centre? Because that's a very important cultural institution yeah, yeah, it is. You know, it, it's across a, the UK, it's, for the UK. Yeah, it's a priceless institution that really is a village hall of this great nation, a you know, multi-art centre where we everything from classical music to street and skateboard culture, contemporary music, um, literature. It's just extraordinary. And it's on 11 acres of space um, that is really owned by this country and you know in my capacity as chair is to help support the amazing creative visionaries that we have ralph rugoff for the haywood mark ball the overall artistic director um Tugs dada who's the head of classical music these are brilliant souls um but you know um culture is not being invested in arts not being invested in i wish our government will do more so it's my job to go out there and and work with our leadership team to make sure we get as much support from this government as we can do, and also donors and and corporate partners, and to keep making sure people know that not just London is open, but South Bank is open to all, and it's the most inclusive and uh, diverse art centre I believe in the world. And of course, uh, we host the Baftas and the London <laughs> Film Festival, which which obviously means we we are uh, a, a very good friend of the film industry as well, which is makes me very happy and I, I guess my final question bringing it back to the after um i guess what what do you hope audiences take away from the film you know i never thought about anything you know anything that glorious that a lot of people are whispering about this film i thought about somebody who feels alone that happens to sit down for 18 minutes and they go on the journey of self-love go on the journey of recognizing that we all have scars and that's okay. Mm -hmm. If I can reach even a couple of folks through through this film and the reach it has, that's that's it. I'm happy. I, I'll be more than happy. So that that's what I want to achieve. Everything else is a lovely little bonus, but I wanted to reach people because I know people need to feel some of the feelings that are, hopefully are unlocked within those 18 minutes. Miss Anne, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. And everyone, go check out the film, The After. It's only 18 minutes, um, 36 if you're watching it twice, because you should. Uh, yes. Check it on Netflix worldwide today. Yes. Thank you, sir.